Siri, call Max. What up? Dude, come downstairs. Chuck Norris is across the street. Chuck. Chuck. Chuck? Where is he? Not cool, man. Welcome to the beautiful campus of Wake Forest University. It's the number 13 Tennessee Volunteers taking on the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. It's week two for NCAA college soccer, the 2018 season. Hello, everybody. I'm Ty Collins from Spry Stadium alongside Sari Rose. The Tennessee Volunteers are 4-0 against Wake Forest. This will be the fifth meeting. The last time they played was 2007. That was at a neutral site. But the last time they played here was in 2002. That's decades ago. So uh, two NCAA tournament teams taking on each other. What do you think, Sari? Well, this is a great early season matchup between the SEC and the ACC. Both teams advanced in the NCAA tournament last year and are trying to build on that success going into this season. And a lot of, a lot of attention is going to go on Katie Cousins because Coach Tony Deleuze said that offense moves through her. Well, once again, Brian Penske, he said she was the point guard of this volunteer team. And for them to have success, she's got to get touches on the ball. One person that also has to have success for Wake Forest, there she is, the captain number nine, Bailey Feist. Last season, she had eight goals and two assists, but is really the energy of this squad. And we're going to see a lot of movement out of her in the midfield. And she... Now, last season, they took on South Carolina, got the upset. Let's see if Wake Forest can do it again. It's SEC, ACC coming up. This little light of mine. About 10 years ago, I almost lost my voice. Now I sing on the praise team. When I got my voice back, it changed my life. My education also changed my life. It helps me run a more successful business. I'm Trisetta Briggs. Indiana Wesleyan helped me and my voice shine brighter. You are a light, and with a little help from Indiana Wesleyan University, your light can shine brighter than you ever thought possible. Attention Tri-State, let's trade keys during the Hyundai Epic Summer Sales Event at Kerry Hyundai in Alexandria. Exchange your current vehicle for any one of Kerry Hyundai's epic new lineup, like the all-new Kona or Santa Fe SUVs or the Sporty Veloster or the all-new Stylish Sonata. And we may be able to match or even lower your current payment. Plus, every new Hyundai comes with America's best warranty, 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty and Hyundai Assurance. Get epic summer deals, apply for easy credit, or schedule service online at thehyundaistore.net. No one does it quite like Kerry Hyundai in Alexandria. Welcome to Spry Stadium. It's number 13, Tennessee Volunteers taking on the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. And Wake Forest did not get the win over Northwestern. They lost 2-0. They'll take a number 13, Tennessee team. They're coming in with a 4-3-3 lineup. They're also using six seniors. There's a lot of talented and yet experienced players on this team. We talked about Katie Cousins in the midfield also have to look out for Flynn and Marcano. Gilroy also number five on that right attacking. She's from Belmore, North, uh, New York, SEC freshman team. And here's Wake Forest. There's Ryan Brown. She got the start in Indianapolis or in Bloomington. She'll get the start again. She's got Laurier on the left and Ricci Brown up top. And Wake Forest in dire straits to trying to get this offense clicking. Did not score against Northwestern and just couldn't get the offense going. But hopefully here at home turf, they can get that chemistry going. Spry Stadium getting, getting some folks into the door. And there's Coach Penske, who's used to be a coach of the year of the ACC back in 2010 when he was coaching Maryland. Here he is donning the Tennessee orange. Has done a fantastic job for Tennessee. Out of bounds, it'll be a throw in for Tennessee. There's Coach Tony to lose. He's only six wins shy from 300, a career of 294, 199, and 46. He has been the man here at Wake Forest. He's trying to get 
back again to the NCAA tournament after they upset Georgetown last year on this pitch. It was an exciting game, got down to overtime, and it was Nani Frechette that became the hero. Well, you talked a little bit about the, the outing in Indiana for the Deeks, and they were supposed to play IU on Friday night. Weather comes in, they wait, they wait, they end up canceling the game, and so the first game of the season is canceled. And that's psychologically kind of how do we handle that, right? And then they come in against a Northwestern team uh, coached by Mike Monahan, who's just been a fantastic coach. Uh, that team's now ranked in the top 25, and so it's Sunday afternoon. They're on the road, and they're getting that first game. And believe it or not, they actually dominated a lot of that possession. They had nine corner kicks. Wake's very dangerous on the corner kicks, just wasn't able to capitalize. But that early goal by Northwestern five minutes in just put the, the Deeks kind of on their heels. And so it'll be interesting. They're now home. They've had a week to talk about it and interesting to see how they come out here and it was a wet pitch which is the reason why they did cancel the game against uh, indiana and they played northwestern like you said sari it seemed like the, the the wind was sucked out of the sails so that's one thing that coach tony to wanted to work on this week keeping that energy level high especially when you're playing a very very talented team like the tennessee volunteers Tennessee Volunteers now moving it towards the back. Again, there's Katie Cousins, number 22. We'll hear a lot about her. And G. DeFranco, the freshman, fantastic young player for the Deeks, is kind of keeping an eye on Cousins, making sure that she is not going to find the ball easily. You're also probably going to see Hannah Bedford dropping back sometimes and denying those passes into 22 Cousins. Long ball trying to get an early attack again going on to that right side. That's Olivia Voss from Poland, a new addition to this Wake Forest team. Laurie Air keeps speaking of international. There's Laurie Air from France. She really stepped into her role last year, doing a big part of the offense for Coach Tony to lose. Madison Hammond blocking it. There's the other captain. Two captains right there, Peyton Perea and Madison Hammond. And a trickled shot right to Frechette. And Frechette came in her freshman year. She was splitting time with Lindsey Preston. Next year, they split it early on, and then Preston won out for those next season. But she has a ton of minutes for the Deeks and has now stepped into that leadership role competitions coming from the freshman Mia Rabin, Sam Rabin, who's on the men's team, his sister, she's vying for that spot. Um, but once again, an experienced keeper in there with Frigette. I'll tell you what too, sir. I mean, you get a game like she did against Georgetown where they brought her off the bench in PK situation and she just came up clutch. Nani Frigette, I, I tell you, that confidence. She only played 74 minutes last year and right there kind of just said, listen, I'm going to be the one in charge for the phones for the coming season. And she has done that, and she's now in between the pipes for Coach Tony to lose. Four saves against Northwestern. Did allow two goals. But Wake Forest trying to seek out that chemistry early here. This is their second game of the 2018 season. Tennessee played St. John's, beat them, scored in the 75th minute. And they took on George Mason and handedly beat them 4-0. It's interesting, Tennessee came out early on and they lost that exhibition to Alabama. Alabama, you know, under new leadership the last few years. Um, so to, to come out and have such a fantastic season in 2017, they get that first loss, but really rebounded against St. John's and George Mason. And so this is a fantastic test for this Lady Volunteer squad. Brian Brown going directly to Feist. Feist had her hand up, and there's a shot just right of the goal. You saw that developing as Ryan Brown looked up, and that's, that's a great key by the sophomore. As soon as she got the ball, she looked up. Bailey Feist had her hand up, 
and she immediately played. Well, and I think that's the type of runs we see from Wake Forest. They really get those midfielders making those deep penetrating runs. You know, Bedford does a good job of holding the ball. Brown looks up, she sees that change pointing of the attack, and look at just how Feist was able to get in behind M.A. Vignola, and that's something that could haunt Feist a little bit, but there is a ton of time in this match, and there will be other opportunities. You know, one of those six seniors for, for, for Tennessee is Shea Yanez, senior out of Downington, PA, another part of that SEC watch list. She had 21 starts last year, eight complete shutouts, just allowed two goals in that 9-0 start that they started the 2017 season, which was absolutely ridiculous school uh, history, um, program history, actually, so that would a fantastic start to their 2017 season. Here they are 2-0 and and not allowing a single goal to come into the night's game. Well, and that's something that Coach Penske talked about. You know, last year was their return to the NCAA tournament after five years. And he said, you know, this senior group, there are seven seniors, including two fifth-year seniors. You know, they've, they've seen the low points, and now they're experiencing this high. And then he's got this sophomore class that really hasn't known losing. And he said it's a very interesting dichotomy on the team, um, and they really want to build off of that momentum from last year. Last year they kind of got that sniff of the NCAA and now they want to work on advancing deeper into that competition. A nice thing to have, Sari, because you've got the senior leadership along with the number 21 recruiting class coming in. Well, and you, and you look at Wake Forest, almost similar. You know, once again, they had a hiatus from the tournament. Last year, they were able to get to the second round. They had you know, freshman Vicky Krug, who's just an absolute professional German player, plays right back for them, but could really play anywhere. You're now seeing Olivia Voss coming in as that other center back who had to replace the unbelievable career of Ali Haran. And you've got Hannah Bedford, you know, came in last year, scored a bunch of girls goals early on, got injured, and sort of was dealing with that injury throughout the year but she's she's healthy and so I think we're seeing an Estelle Laurier on the ball you know she's now got a year under her more confidence a little more grit um, and so both of these teams are in an interesting yet similar situation at this point in the season They're both coming from juggernaut conferences like the SEC and ACC we'll talk about a little bit about that with how many teams are being represented in the top 25 throw in for Tennessee. And there's Coach Tony Deleuze and talking about his newcomer, Olivia Voss. He said just coming from Europe, trying to get used to the American style, the collegiate style. A little, I guess a little bit more aggressive, you could say. But uh, said a lot of good things about her, as well as Vicki Krug, of course. And what a great tool she is for Coach Tony Deleuze. And you're looking at that back line, you know, Madison Hammond, 99, she came in, has been an impact player since day one. She's actually somebody we're going to look to probably see get more into the attack. Wake Forest likes to get those outside backs. They play the 4-3-3, and they like to kind of get those backs in, getting services in, and really attacking. There's Ravenna trying to serve the long ball to Ryan Brown trickle down to the final third of Wake Forest, but possession back to the Volunteers. There's Bedford putting a little pressure on. Pressure going to be a key thing, Sarah. I'm not sure if they're going to use that high pressure or back off, play conservatively. St. John's did a good job of pressuring in, in the first game. And here's Tennessee getting inside the box. Well played by Ravenna. We're going to throw in on Tennessee's final third. And that was a good run by Anna Bialzak, number 23. But Ravenna does a good job of recovering and just getting a foot on it, popping it out wide. Well done, just with a, getting her body right in front of it and just to play it out and poke it away. But still, Tennessee down here on their final third sit here locked at zero apiece. And here's the freshman, Giovanna DeMar DeMarco. Put it to sophomore Bedford. Bedford's trying to trail it down, but as you can't get it, 
Be out of bounds and a throw in for Wake Forest, though. And Bedford's the type of player she likes to get to the ball, back to pressure. She can she can hold the ball really well. At the same time, we're going to see a ton of movement from those Wake Forest forwards, and really just one of those players that I think added a nice little fire to the team last year. Screw going to check in with Bailey, but we'll play Laurie Air. Laurie very skilled with her feet. It's been interesting to see her develop. You know, she redshirted that freshman year. I would say last year was a little timid at times, you know, not necessarily imposing herself on players. Clearly has the skill, but I think we've seen her a little more physical, a little more confident on the ball and in what she can do taking players on, you know, demanding the ball. You can kind of see sometimes you're gonna see her actually motioning like, hey, play me. There's Ryan Brown, someone to watch too, the sophomore out of Indianapolis. Here's Bedford, sophomore to sophomore, looking for someone to be right there at the penalty stripe, but no one was there. But a great opportunity, Wake Forest, and they continue to threaten here. Here's Ryan Brown with a nice step over, sending the cross. And the freshman right there, DeMarco, couldn't quite get her boot around it. I think we're going to see a lot of great things from this freshman player and you know there's cousins coming all the way back and once again wake forest finding themselves in the clear inside of that 18 just unable to finish sherry you know going by what you're seeing so far tennessee obviously 13th in the country Wake Forest come out with some good energy, would you say? Definitely. I think they're trying to impose themselves on Tennessee. You know, the one thing Wake Forest has always got to be cognizant of the fact is because when they get numbers forward, they expose those pockets. And so really one of the things that Tennessee is going to look to do is see can they counter, can they get in transition and get opportunities like we're seeing here where they're able to, to kind of pop out and get a player running on and putting pressure on that back line. Luckily. Forces back line was able to stop Yelzak as she was streaking right down the middle of the field. It looked like it was going to be 1v1 with her and Frechette. And there's Laurier. She scored in that exhibition game against West Virginia, a very talented West Virginia team. And Wake Forest actually you know, played really well against a very talented Mountaineer team. But ended up losing that exhibition game. Nikki Izzo is just one of those coaches that has been just a, 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 a beacon um, with regards to being a, a female head coach, has a family. She really is, is constantly producing top 25 teams, NCAA tournament teams, you know, Final Four teams, just has really built that West Virginia, West Virginia University um, into, you know, just one of the top programs in the country and is, is always putting um, together great efforts. Used to recruit heavily from Canada, still does, um, but it's always good to see the success from Nikki Izzo Brown. You're seeing a lot of that. Is there a lot of uh, talent pool coming from Canada? Is that a new trend? I would say probably about 10 years ago, everybody was sort of thinking like, wow, we have to um, find other avenues, you know, because of the parity in women's soccer and the increase in scholarship, you were going to Canada, uh, you could bring in these players. I still think there's there's tons of uh, unbelievable Canadian players coming to the US, but actually what we're seeing now is, is, is getting more into Europe. You're seeing, um, you know, players not just from England, but, you know, France, Germany, Poland. Um, there was always a couple of good Swiss players that came out, you know, New Zealand. Um, but, you know, if you look at Tennessee, and we haven't had a chance to mention it, but Bunny Shaw is, is absent from the lineup tonight. She is a player that is on the full Jamaican national team back in May. They were down in Haiti competing in the first round of CONCACAF World Qualifying. She had the tying goal in Haiti versus Haiti to actually send Jamaica to the uh, second round and so from now until I believe September 1st the second round of qualifying is going on and so the reggae girls um, spurred on by Bunny Shaw and is uh, trying to get that qualifying spot which will be in Texas later in October. That's an amazing feat for Bunny Shaw the transfer out of Eastern Florida State and there was a shot by Katie Cousins Kind of tested for Shed a little bit, but that'll be Tennessee's second shot of the night. Wake Forest with just one. Eye on the 
play out wide to Vicky Krug. And Bunny Shaw will be missed tonight. She's one of the top strikers in the nation according to topdrawersoccer.com. And there's that movement we were seeing from Wake Forest. You know, Laurier drops back. They were trying to find DeMarco, kind of making that run into the back line, and then Laurier recycling. And so we're seeing a lot of that movement by Wake Forest. Got a little under 30 minutes left to go in the first half. 0-0 zero, zero between the two schools. Two shots for Tennessee, one for Wake Forest. One good opportunity, Wake Forest, and maybe one good opportunity for Tennessee so far. See Hannah Bedford all the way down here in the defensive third for Wake Forest. Kick it out, it'll be a throw in for the Volunteers. The Volunteers who got to the tournament, they beat Murray State, and they lost to Washington State in PKs, which is just a terrible way to go out, you know I mean? It, Wake Forest was successful in their first round against Georgetown PKs, but Tennessee played a very good game against Washington State, it went to PKs and then lost. Well, and, you know, Bunny Shaw, who we were just talking about, you know, got a, got a you know, concussion in that Murray State game. Danielle Marcona, who is um, starting for her tonight, ended up getting three goals between those two <laughs> NCAA games. Um, and so, you know, once again, a quality replacement. But losing Shaw in that NCAA tournament probably hurt them a little bit. Um, and so they're happy to have her back. But, you know, having that depth, the, the beauty of the ACC and the SEC is a lot of these teams can go two and three players deep and, and not lose too much out of that starting 11. Well, Coach Pinsky and Coach Tony DeLuza are obviously very familiar with each other. Just like we said earlier, but Pinsky used to be the coach of Maryland. who was in the ACC. Tony DeLuza has been here for now his 22nd year. Here's a sh maybe a shot a service. And you're looking at number seven, M.A. Vignolia by Tennessee. She's getting into the 18. She's a kid who's played pretty much every position for the Tennessee Volunteers. She came in and was a forward. She's played back. Um, but you can see her. She likes to get forward. She likes to get into the 18. She's got a, a goal and I think two assists on the year. Um, and so we may see her moving around depending on how this game goes, maybe even getting up top. That's a great trap by Bedford right there on that left side. They're giving her some space to work with as now she'll switch sides to Laurier. Bailey Feist going to overlap here on the right side and she'll play her. DeMarco inside the box. Bailey Feist trying to find her in the box and then sniffed out by Katie Cousins. Feist again. Taking on that's going to have two volunteers on her. She's got her support, she'll use her. And Vicki Krug will put one in the box. And not exactly what we're used to seeing from Vicki Krug. She can put one, a nice floater inside the 18. That one didn't go exactly how she planned. But Wake Forest still on the attack. DeMarco, well played to Bedford. Bedford, maybe get a shot now. Great block by Maya Neal. Junior just kind of threw her body in front of that. And knowing the type of shot Bedford can put, I'm sure that put a stinger on her. Let's take a look at that replay. And you see she's not afraid to strike from distance. That's one of the things that I think Wake Forest is such a possession-oriented team that I think in years past sometimes they possessed, they possessed, but they didn't have that bite when they got around the goal. And I think Bedford has that. I think Feist has that. I think we're seeing Laurier has sort of you know, developed that. Ravenna just trying to do a one touch right back into the midfield for Wake Forest. Wake Forest donning those old gold jerseys. Uh, just about intercepted by the volunteers, Megan Flynn. Two shots apiece between these two so far. Still sitting at 0 0. Last 
year, Wake Forest opened up against a top five opponent, South Carolina, and upset him. And it was a good reason was that because of number 33, Bedford. South Carolina has one of my favorite players, Savannah McCaskill. She's gotten a, some showing with the U.S. national team, but she is just such a, a dynamic, feisty, takes the team, puts it on her back. I think she had two goals that night. I can remember after the game, they were going to play high point, texting the high point coach and saying, <laughs> USC just lost, and I think McCaskill's angry. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> That's right. You just saw Hannah Bedford there, the sophomore out of Charleston, South Carolina. Had 17 starts as a freshman last year. And second on the team with five goals. Blues has high hopes for her as a big attacking part of this offense, and they need it. Still have yet to get a goal here in the 2018 season. And there's a captain, Peyton Perea. We haven't called her name enough blatant uh, jersey pull there by Bialzek, but one of the things is, is you know, a lot of the play is set by Perea when she has the ball, and, and Tennessee has denied that a little, so we've seen more of DeMarco. We've seen some of Feist. Interesting to see if Perea can start to find those pockets, get the ball more. And she's happy to be back on the field. She got injured in October. She got back for the postseason play. Now she's here for her senior campaign as captain of the Deacons along with Madison. So it is her team now. And Coach Tony Deleuze is very happy to have both of these quality leaders there as Madison Hammond. And there's the other captain, the junior. I'd say Peyton Perea is probably the most vocal out there. She's the one that kind of can right the ship a little bit. And Kate Ravenna just stepped into the starting lineup last year. You know, Ali Haran was kind of the leader back there, but Ravenna was more vocal, and now she's had to ad adapt into that center back leadership role for the Deeks. Here's a great run by Ryan Brown. Ball's going to go into the corner there. If there was one person that could probably track that down, it's Ryan Brown, but it was a little too heavy on the touch there as it goes out of bounds and a goal kick for the Vols. Zero, zero. You kind of expecting this kind of match between these two, both kind of trying to figure out attack. I know with Bunny Shaw not being here, Tennessee still trying to figure out what they're going to do. But they've had some op they've had some opportunities. That will go out of bounds. Well, I think Wake Forest plays a little more possession style game. Tennessee is a little more direct. They've got some athletes that can get on the end of the balls. Um, so it's playing out evenly, I think, as both coaches probably expected. You know, Wake Forest, I think, has a, a little bit better of the play, a little more opportunities in the final third at this stage of the game. We'll see who flinches first. We saw the Wake Forest men's soccer team. Slated to play tomorrow night against number two, Indiana. Both top five teams to start the season off. That's, that's a November, December matchup, right? <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, I like playing a good team early on. I Actually, when Ange Kelly was at Tennessee, talking about how the fact that she would always take Tennessee and go and play Carolina, and they would get spanked, like 3 nothing or 4 nothing. And this is, you know, once again, 10 years ago when Ange was there. Um, and she said it was great because early on they could see what their faults were, and then they could actually spend the next part of that early season making those adjustments. So when they got to the SEC competition, they'd already been exposed, and they knew what those weaknesses were. And so every coach has a little different philosophy. You know, once again, it, it kind of depends on uh, – the roster that you have and, and who you're returning and some coaches maybe try and play some weaker competition early on to give their teams a little more confidence but I, I do think there's so much to gain by, by having one of those big matchups early and then being able to to figure out where you go from there. Well, it's definitely going to be a big matchup. There's Laurier right there. Check this hip check out with Tennessee Bailey Feist here on that right touch line. And just knocked off the ball with Laurier but Found. I'm not sure what the call exactly is, but it'll be a throw-in for the Vols. And a substitution there. 
Number 17, Amy Thompson for Tennessee coming in up top. Amy Thompson's a freshman, but she's had both game-winning goals <laughs> for the Volunteers. Comes off the bench, really gives them a spark. She got a goal against George Mason. Definitely a nice spark to have off the bench. And I think Coach Pinsky's just trying to throw some things out here to get some kind of offense going. But Bailey Feist looking for Peyton Perea. And here's that counterattack and then tr that transition. They've got Megan Flynn on the left. Wake has the number advantage defensively, and Vicki Krug is a terrific 1v1 defender, but a good service in, and just nobody on Tennessee, they're able to find it. Cousins immediately plays it over here to the left. service inside the box. A oh, great touch by Cousins. Look at that. DeMarco got the foul on her, but did you see the touch by Cousins? Able to settle that immediately at her feet. Free kick awarded to the Vols. Under 20 minutes to go in the first half. 0-0. Zero, zero. Let's take a look at that foul. It looks like yeah. DeMarco had the pull and then the fall. And once again, not terrible, but definitely whistle worthy. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty gutsy too by the freshman, right? Getting right in there and trying to pull down Katie Cousins. There's a a try at least, and that's a little too too much on that one as it goes off to the right. Just a bit outside. Just a bit outside. Beautiful night here in the triad. A little sneak preview of the fall. It's interesting. Tennessee is, is kind of letting the ball get played back to the goalkeeper. They really have denied the pass into Perea. Wake Forest sometimes will play that ball back and then have her come in and get the ball. We haven't seen that too much, but they haven't really pressured Noni Fajet. And I think that's one of the things, you know, can they put her under a little pressure, see what she can do. Almost a chance there for Wake Forest. And you see Cousins pulling all the way back here to that defensive line. You see the signaling on that right side to use that right alleyway and the right channel, and that's what they're going to do. Hammond played that very well. Yeah, read that ball, dropped back. You know, really trying to deny those balls over the top. They don't want to get into a foot race. Smart play by Hammond. Over here, kind of checking to that touch line. Bedford couldn't come to. And Maya Neal immediately had to intercept that one. Here's Tennessee in the midfield. Moving now, going to try to the right side. Now they're going to check and go long to the left. And wide open is Flynn. Comes Bielzak. Bielzak puts it in the curler. We find the far stick option, but Frechette was there. Peyton Perea, captain the captain. Wake Forest in that first game against Northwestern, they only really went to three deep. Not going to see them sub a lot. Too heavy on that touch, too, as Bailey Feist kind of backed off it. And here's some pressure by Hannah Bedford. So throwing some pressure back there a little bit, too, with trying to pressure the senior goalkeeper. Bedford not allowing them too much time. As Krug now looks for an option. checks in. Is I go up and over to Bedford. Bedford's still fighting for it. This could be dangerous. Look like there's a little miscommunication yeah, there. Yeah, you know, 
Shea Yanez is a leader on the team. She's usually very, very confident. There's a little bit of hesitation, and then when she hesitated, she kind of lost her footing, and so maybe a little miscommunication there. Senior leadership comes into, into play there. You have to bark at him and say, hey, everybody get out of the way, it's my ball. DeMarco tried to put a head on that one. And Tennessee charging. Right and up. that's the thing, if you are gonna have Tennessee go and put pressure on the keeper and run at her like that, the team behind her has to make sure that they're closing off those, those um, pockets and making sure that they're finding those players so that that ball can be won, that first ball out can be won. If not, it can be trouble. You never wanna have one person pressing and then the rest of the team just kinda hanging out. Peyton Pereira backed off that. Bailey Feist coming all the way back here to take the possession back to Wake Forest. Bedford playing very physical tonight. So just using Medford up there, lonely attacker to kind of pressure a little bit in his Tennessee. They've yeah. dropped into like a, almost like a four-five-one defensively. You know, everything with formations, you play a four-one-two-three, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, but a four-three-three three defensively becomes a Four, five, one, and there's the goal by Feist. I called it. That you did. It. At the beginning of the match, talking about the fact she had eight goals last year. She's the energy of the team. See if she gets a goal tonight. And there is the senior Bailey Feist coming up for the big for the Deeks with 13 minutes left in the half. Her first of the year and kind of breaks that seal for the Deeks. And there's Bedford just slips that ball in. And she's able to beat Giannis near post with the right. Beautifully played. Giannis just didn't seem like she really like got her feet into position, kind of fell more than really attacked that ball. But great effort there by Bailey Feist giving the Deeks the go-ahead goal with 13 minutes left in the half. How fitting it is, the first goal of the 2018 season is by the captain number nine, or not, excuse me, the senior, <laughs> Bailey Feist. There's Bree Carney. And some Tennessee faithful here. Traveling well as usual. And volunteers, first goal that they have allowed this season. And Wake Forest, kind of in the last 15 minutes, they saw Laurier not necessarily as active. They put in Bree Carney. Bree Carney, another player who's gotten a ton of minutes over the years for Wake Forest. And then on the opposite side, we've got another substitution in for the Deeks. Calling as soon as we can see it. Trying to get that number. Tennessee now still trying to attack. So Lara Jordan, there's a new Tennessee volunteer that checked in. One nil, a beautiful run by Bailey Feist, and she's been all over the pitch for Wake Forest. She made her, she timed her run perfectly. Bedford found her, Bedford gets the assist, and Wake Forest is up one nil. So we head towards the end of the first half, about 11 minutes to go. This is the first time Tennessee's been down this season, two games, both were shut out, so Brian Penske gets to see how his team will react, what adjustments need to be made at halftime. I will say I have a ton of respect for the Tennessee coaching staff. You see the replay here of, of Bedford playing that ball in to Bailey Feist, but ton of respect for the Tennessee staff. Brian Penske, great coach. You know, his assistant, Joe Kurt, goalkeeper coach, fantastic guy. And then John Morgan, who had been a head coach at Maryland. He had been assistant at Rutgers. Um, I always said John Morgan used to sit up in the Rutgers game and watch from the booth. And then he would come in and kind of give the adjustments and usually spot on. So it'll be interesting to see what that staff does going into halftime, what adjustments they make and how Tennessee comes out. There's Penske right there. And believe it or not, like when he was with Maryland, he had that number one seed in 2010. 
And I believe that was the year that they lost to Wake Forest in the ACC championship game, if I'm not mistaken. Just quality Just coaching staff. You know, Tony Deleuze, he's been here for 20 plus years. His assistant is Jason Lowe, who had been at Alabama. He was a player here. They brought on Courtney Owen, who had been an undergraduate volunteer the previous year. She's come on full. You know, once again, when you're, when you're looking at your SEC and ACC staffs, you're usually finding those quality top players. A lot of times you do have that head coach that decides, hey, I'm going to come and be an assistant because it is such um, an incredible opportunity. A lot of gold jerseys there trying to stop the volunteer attack, and now they've got it on the left side. And that's Ashley Frank, the freshman that came in. And she is a scrappy freshman, for sure. Out of Florida, Niceville, Florida, 5-2. Number 15 prospects in Florida. Got some speed on her as well. What's interesting is there's nine minutes left in this half and there has not been a corner kick. And Wake Forest had nine <laughs> in their game against Northwestern. And last year, Tennessee owned that category with 99 corners. And Wake Forest actually they own that category for them with 114 corners to their opponent, 81. And here we are sitting with under 10 minutes without a single corner. At this level, the ability of your back line and your goalkeeper to not give up corners is crucial because set pieces at this level are so vital at times. And so can you get that ball out for a throw in as opposed to a quarter kick? Can you make that first save instead of parrying it out wide? You, you don't want to give up those opportunities due to the skill of these teams usually taking those corner kicks, set pieces, et cetera. And one of the things that Brian Pensier talked to him a little bit earlier today, you know, his key to the game was really trying to deny set pieces um, from Wake Forest and, and making sure that they limited them as much as possible. That's one thing to ask. Sarah used to be a goalkeeper. When you're having a back line that you lose somebody like Ali Heron, how do you, as, as the goalkeeper, try to keep that line, keep that chemistry going, and keep that confidence up when you lose such a key part of that back line? Well, and I think it's important as a goalkeeper that you're really the leader back there. I mean, you see everything. And so, you know, I used to joke I had to hop in goal when I was, was coaching at UNC Charlotte and the goalkeeper would always say, well, you don't get as many shots. And I said, well, that's because I'm more experienced and I'm organizing my backs better, you know, and kind of a shout out to Julie Black there. But it, it's true, you know, can that goalkeeper really help that back line see what are those maybe runners that are coming from the weak side and, and who's open and, and trying to put themselves in a position where they can support and be an outlet. And here we have Franks making a nice run down the side, getting that ball in. McNamara right there had a one touch. And that's set up just nicely. Freshman to sophomore almost connected. To make it 2-0. And Abby McNamara was one of the substitutes that stood out in that Northwestern game. Ton of energy, likes to get on the ball able to make things happen. And you see there, just couldn't finish on that. But Wake Forest getting some quality time off of the bench late in this half. Now let's see if, if Wake Forest, if they continue that energy, they started break with the energy. They did in Northwestern, it kind of died down with the home crowd and see if they can keep up that energy as they move towards the second half. Feist fighting for that one. They had DeMarco right in the middle. Beautiful turn by the freshman and lost it. And McNamara checked in for Bedford. Not giving as much pressure as Bedford did. And Bree Carney, number 45, 
Saw a lot of her last year. She's another one of these spark plugs that can start then also come off the bench. And she's got a lot of good pace. Another good weapon for Coach Tony Deleuze to use. Krug sniffs that one out, trying to play Carney, but it goes right back to the Volunteers. Krug again fighting for it. Here's Flynn. Flynn going to put one in and look for somebody there. Really only one option. That's Rochette. Comes up to meet it. Four shots for Wake Forest, just three for Tennessee thus far. And Tennessee has yet to commit a foul. Five for Wake Forest. Krug and Flynn going out, I believe. You see Krug kind of saying, this is my ground too, you know. <laughs> that was Flynn. I spoke with uh, the Northwestern coach, Mike Moynihan, this week, and he was talking about Wake Forest and complimenting Coach Tony Deleuze on the style of play. And he was saying how it's it's nice to play a team that, that really tries to play the game and is so possession-oriented. And then he kind of chuckled because the fouls in that game were like nine to seven. <laughs> and he was saying that in the Big Ten, a lot of times, like one team could commit 16 fouls on their own in a game. And so he was really respectful of, of the Deeks and um, you know the style of the play and how they really can just knock it around and are very creative on the ball but you know, definitely an interesting you know you talk about the, the different conferences and there is such parity in the ACC which used to be sort of like the, the preeminent conference and you know then the Pac-12 now has come on winning Stanford winning last year and now the SEC um, but there are little still style nuances among or across the conferences within the conferences, right. sorry. The conferences within the conferences, that's right. And we saw that, that good shot by a camera guy, uh, saw that, that that foul that kind of got Krug a little upset. Flynn went down and kind of put her cleat out a little bit and Krug didn't take too kindly of it, obviously. So Flynn's a feisty little player. I mean, really has done well against Krug. I think limited, you know, the opportunities that Krug's gotten into the attack. You know, one of the things that, that Coach Penske said is that, you know, Flynn's work rate and what she does defensively is, is so important for the volunteers and the, the way they try and play and how they try and press. Putting on a nice little press here is it maybe a chance for the volunteers to tie this thing up. That was great defense by the Wake Forest team and Deacon captain. That's Madison Hammond. But a corner kick now awarded to Tennessee, the first corner of the game, coming with about two minutes left to go. I believe that's Paige, Paige Franks Page. is looking to take that. And you can see Wake Forest, they do not want to give up a goal. They've got all 11 players into the 18. Watch Tennessee, look how they kind of do a shotgun thing. Punching and then immediately exploding. Oh, well played by the keeper for Shet coming out. But I, you know, I got to give Pinsky credit for that. I mean, these corner kicks, I like how they can cause a lot of confusion. And that right there, when you have everybody bunched, you have no idea what's going to happen. So it's all about you know timing and everything. So when you see something like that, and I saw that a lot in the St. John's game, it was very, very, very um, tactical and quite a, a tool to have, especially if you're a talented team like Tennessee. Well, I think it's always interesting, you know, you, each team, you know, knows what their strengths are, and, and it's something where you'll have coaches that will have certain corner kick set pieces they use early on in the season, and then because they've been seen, they have to vary it up once they get into conference play. And so now we see here another foul there by Flynn. But it is something it is something you work on them and you see what works, and then I know sometimes we would have a, a play that we would work on for – you know, midway through the season, but we would wait until we got to our conference tournament because we wanted it to be something that we could surprise the opposition with late in the season. Um, and so you'll see teams run a variety of plays and also depends on the personnel in there. Mm -hmm. We've yet to see Wake Forest on the corner. I've, I've heard about Olivia Voss and her ability to really 
play a great left-footed in-swinging ball in. Well, five seconds, they're just gonna let this clock tick down to the end of the first half, and Wake Forest stunning the Volunteers with a goal by Bailey Feist, the first goal recorded for the 2018 season for Wake Forest. It's by number nine, the senior, Bailey Feist, putting the Deeks up against number 13, the Tennessee Volunteers. Welcome to Toyota's National Clearance Event. Thanks, I hear it's your biggest event of the year. Yeah, you can save on the remaining 2018s. And with super low APR financing and great lease deals, any of these Toyotas can be yours. We have a few more. Oh. Now get any sporty new 2018 Camry with low 0.9% financing or just announced $1,000 cash back or lease this Camry LE for just $209 a month. Oh, wow. Toyota, let's go places. Now at Speedway, buy any three cooler drinks and get a thousand bonus Speedy Rewards points. So get one to wake up, one to cool down, and one to get through the day. One for you and two to share. Or all three for yourself. One for the driver, one for the shotgun, one for the back seat. Or one for now, one for later, and one for even later. Three for after you finish those. And maybe a backup set, just in case. the international flavor in Spry Stadium. That's how many players they have representing different countries here for Wake Forest, Poland, Germany. Also got France. So it's uh, Iceland, of course. That's uh, Arna's daughter, which you haven't quite seen yet, but she is someone you will see in the near future. And we'll Tennessee at 13 in the country. Wake Forest got a little, got some votes in the preseason. But SEC and ACC always up in the top 25. You see, Penn, you see North Carolina at number four. And North Carolina, Anson Doris getting his thousandth win this year in those two early games. Of course, Florida at the SEC, they're landing on top. Duke at number 11. And Duke, I think, one of the top teams in the nation, lost their first week. Janet Rayfield and Fighting Ill and I were able to come in and get that early win but then you look at nc state from the acc tim santora has done a fantastic job revitalizing the wolf pack and then rounding out at 20 is notre dame under a new coach the former coach at liberty and then here we see 21 through 25 and it's washington state team the team that beat tennessee in the ncaa tournament in that pk and then auburn auburn's always a team that's always someone to reckon with and a team that actually tennessee's had a lot of success with and there's West Virginia rounding out that top 25. Six ACC teams in the top 25. The SEC has only four, but again, he said, Sari, the SEC, ACC, just always are gonna make their presence known at top 25, and along with Tennessee bringing in that top 25 recruiting class. But we're 1-0 Wake Forest with a lead over 13 volunteers. We'll be back in a few. Welcome. So what do you look for in a vehicle? Dependability is top on my list. Well then here's some vehicles that deliver on that. That's our truck. They're our cars. Chevy's the only brand to have earned J.D. Power Dependability Awards across cars, trucks, and SUVs three years in a row. Get 15% below MSRP on most Chevy Equinox models when you finance with GM Financial. That's over $5,600 on this Equinox. See your Tri-State Chevy dealers. It took guts to start my business, but as it grew bigger and bigger, it took a whole lot more. And that's why I switched to the Spark Cash Card from Capital One. With it, I earn unlimited 2% cash back on everything I buy. Everything. What's in your wallet? Look at that sky. Beautiful August night here in the Triad. Beautiful 80 degrees, and I think was the high today, so and a little sneak preview of fall, and it has beautiful fall weather so far. Wake Forest playing very, very well, like it's midseason form, up 1-0 over number 13, Tennessee. Let's take a look at some of the highlights here in the first half. 
And you see Megan Flynn on that left side trying to get in. Cousins goes from long distance, but Noni Frechette able to get on the end of it. Tennessee had a couple of opportunities, mostly from long range and easy saves for Frigette. And then you see there the great opportunity by Bailey Feist early on. Ryan Brown has been phenomenal on that left side, getting the ball. Another missed opportunity by DeFranco. There you see Kate Ravenna. Mabel coming right away. Here's that goal as Bedford immediately played. Feist, the senior, and she put it in the back of the net just like you called it before the game. And they always play well when number nine scores. Well, she gets the goal to start the 2018 season and has the Deacons up 1-0. Look at that moon. We'll be back with more coming up after the break. Welcome. So what do you look for in a vehicle? Dependability is top on my list. Well, then here's some vehicles that deliver on that. That's our truck. There are cars. Chevy's the only brand to have earned J.D. Power Dependability Awards across cars, trucks, and SUVs three years in a row. Get 15% below MSRP on most Chevy Equinox models when you finance with GM Financial. That's over $5,600 on this Equinox. See your tri-state Chevy dealers. It took guts to start my business. But as it grew bigger and bigger, it took a whole lot more. And that's why I switched to the Spark Cash Card from Capital One. With it, I earn unlimited 2% cash back on everything I buy. Everything. What's in your wallet? Well, there's the guys' football team. The Wake Forest up 1-0 over Tennessee, 13 in the nation. Take a look at those stats, Terry. And Wake Forest has the shot advantage four to three. A lot of those opportunities were missed inside of the 18. But one of the stats that I think stands out for me is the fact that there was only one corner kick and that was the advantage of Tennessee. Wake Forest had nine against Northwestern. Very dangerous on set pieces, but Brian Penske's Lady Volunteers have denied Tennessee those opportunities. Well, it has been quite an amazing game so far. The SEC, ACC, we'll be back. Deeks up 1-0. Welcome. So what do you look for in a vehicle? Dependability is top on my list. Well, then here's some vehicles that deliver on that. That's our truck. There are cars. Chevy's the only brand to have earned J.D. Power Dependability Awards across cars, trucks, and SUVs three years in a row. Get 15% below MSRP on most Chevy Equinox models when you finance with GM Financial. That's over $5,600 on this Equinox. See your tri-state Chevy dealers. Yeah. Heard about the scarecrow who won an award? He was outstanding in his field. <laughs> Welcome back to Spry Stadium. Lake Forest got their first goal of the 2018 campaign and they find themselves up 1-0 over the Volunteers. You see them warming up and getting ready for the second half. The volunteers trickling in as well. So, Sari, here's Laurie Air, another one of those attackers that have really kind of carved out a name for himself for to Coach Tony to lose and Hannah Bedford. Sari, I mean, with, with what you're seeing so far, how do you keep that morale up? How do you keep that? Do you keep the attacking going? Do you keep what you're doing, not, not change anything around if you're Coach Tony to lose? Well, if, if you're Coach Tony Deleuze, I think the same thing. You want to go out with that same game plan. You need to have that mobility. You know, the goals and those opportunities came from the fact that their center midfielders were getting into that back line, getting into the attack. I love the fact that he made those substitutions, you know, eight, in 15 minutes left in the half to give them some more energy. So I like what they're doing. Probably want to see number 14, Peyton Perea, on the ball a little bit more. But... Once again, I think they had a good first half and they need to continue that momentum. If you're Brian Penske, you know, it wasn't a bad half. They no. had some opportunities. I'd like to see them maybe press Wake Forest a little bit more, maybe even put Noni Frigette under pressure. You know, she's been fantastic for the Deeks, but I think that's something that we haven't seen as much of. There's been a couple of glimpses. Um, but, you know, Brian Penske had talked about how his team likes to press, how they like to win the ball in that attacking third, and I'm not sure we saw a ton of that in the first half. 
And you know, another thing we haven't seen in the lobby, we saw Katie Cousin a little bit, but you can see on her face that she's a little frustrated that things aren't going the way she kind of wants it, obviously down 1-0, but you know, she, I think she needs to be fed the ball a lot more than what she's getting, and I think Wake Forest is doing a pretty good job of being able to contain number 22. And like I said, you know, Coach Tony Deleuze knew coming into this game that they had to circle around number 22, Katie Cousins. She did have one good look at goal, and luckily for Wake Forest, Frechette was there to make the save. As here we start off the second half, and Bedford immediately on the ball and lost it. Well, and I think one of the things you have to do is give kudos to Maddie Hammond. I mean, a lot of what Tennessee was looking to do is sort of find that space between Hammond and Voss and play that ball between the seam, and Hammond really was able to shut down that right side. And that right side right there is wide open for Tennessee. That channel was blaringly open. As Tennessee now puts one into the box, but could not get in bounds. It goes past the touchline. And you see a little bit of substitution there by Tennessee on the right side going against Hammond is number 27, Bryce McGinroy. Still have number 23, Anna Bialzik, playing a little more up top. Riley O'Keefe also pressing there a little bit. Another senior leader on the SEC watch list. So many on the SEC watch list for this Rollins here team. Lost count, I believe it's seven. And there's Maya Neal. I, I have to mention this because I'm just so impressed with what she's able to do. Maya Neal, number 32 for the Tennessee Volunteers is a heptathlete. Yeah. And she plays in the fall with Wake, I'm sorry, with Tennessee soccer, and then goes over and starts track as soon as the season's over and is a heptathlete. So seven events she's able to perform in the spring. And she's, I think she's all conference <laughs> as an SEC, one of the top 15 in the nation as a heptathlete. Well, she said that her goal is to, to make the Olympics in that track and field as well as on the women's national team. So, yeah, she can do all that, and there's no wonder that she stayed all 90 minutes for Coach Pinsky back there in le left back position. To be a two-sport athlete at this level is just amazing. I can remember it was um, UCLA had Denisha Adams was a very fast forward for them. And then she would actually, UCLA has such a fantastic softball team. She would be a pinch runner for them. But uh, we are at a soccer match here and Tennessee has the second corner kick of the game. It looks like Cousins is gonna get on that. Let's see if they play that short. They do have an option, let's see if she sends one in. Again, they're bunched there, right there at that penalty stripe. And look at that curling run. Well done by Tennessee, but well played by Wake Forest. Bialzik thought that she had gotten a little touch from a Wake Forest defender, but it is a goal kick for the Deeks, and Frigette plays it out quickly to Voss. Trying to go down the line to the freshman, DeMarco. DeMarco fighting as she did in the first half. She continues here in the second half. Little step over. She sends one into the box. Looking for Bedford and a shot by DeMarco. What a hit. She hit that on the nail and screws, didn't she? And you got to love the freshman going after it. She's getting her shirt pulled by Tennessee. Mackenzie Gooner not letting her have anything easy and stays with it and then blasts the ball. Nice reaction there, almost trying to save herself more than maybe save the ball. Shea Yanez. Now this recruit, this recruiting class that Tony got didn't quite get the accolades like the top 21, but these freshmen have been very impressed with what I've seen thus far. Here comes Tennessee now on attack. Going past Ravenna, Rochette comes up and meets it. And they want a call and they're gonna get it because Rochette got it and then was slipped into. And I see Bedford is holding her side there, but here's the shot, watch this. Just recovers and blasts it right over the shoulder of Neil, and I, I'm not sure how much Yanez saw that, kind of reacting to it. Set wanted a yellow card call, but not going to happen. And now 
four shots for Tennessee, five for Wake Forest, trying to put it into space. And Vicki Krug will tell Nadi to bring it up. And as we're in the second there. half, you know, one of the things you want to be aware of is just the fact of those first and second balls, right? Yeah. It becomes more important to get possession, you know, Tennessee's behind. Are they able to win that first ball if they can't? Can they get the second ball? You know, Wake Forest always has a ton of possession, and so Tennessee has to be able to win that ball and keep it. And a lot of that will come from opportunities on free kicks, et cetera, goal kicks. And Coach Tony Luz was upset with the referees. The referees tonight, Alexander Bueller and referee Javier Rodriguez. Patrick Schmidt, alternative official is Benjamin Wooten. And of course, the time cre keeper as always is Tal Job here in the press box right beside us. So watch this. See, it's too late there, Sarah. I don't know, I mean, you're your keeper. I'm, I'm a little upset with that if I'm Coach Tony Luz. Well, I mean, anytime you're coming into the keeper like that, you know, Daniel Marcano is going after it, but anytime you're falling in front, not usually going to get the call. Most referees are going to try and protect the keeper. A corner kick right there for Tennessee. And Wake Forest has done a good job defending that. There's Ryan Brown coming down here to get the possession back and fighting it is Peyton Perea. The captain comes up with it. What a leader she is for Wake Forest to have. Number 14, Peyton Perea, the senior out of Riverside, California. You see the foul. It doesn't even, it doesn't even phase her at all. She had eight starts last year, 15 appearances. Again, had that in injury, but she is back, and she looks 100%. As they try to check on Laurier on the right side. Bailey Feist, here's a shot and a steamer right to the palm of Yanez. But what a look that Bailey Feist again had. Surprised that they haven't really hit somebody marker. She's been able to get wide open in many opportunities for number nine. Well, and you know, we talked a little bit about the fact that like Wake Forest likes to move their players around. So there's a ton of mobility. She's gonna make different runs constantly checking and moving into space. It's Bailey Feist again, right on cue. Being feisty as usual. Well, I think something that we've seen more in the, in the women's game and, and the U.S. national team really impresses this upon their style of play and what they want from players is can they get those forwards and midfielders to be more aggressive defensively. They not just want a talented attacking player, but you know, a lot of times the defense of a team is set by their forwards. You know, are they pressing? Are they able to be good 1v1 defensively? And so, you know, we're seeing how Hannah Bedford's dropping down, trying to double down. And now Tennessee on the other side here. Oh, well played by Perea. She timed her slide tackle perfectly. And Wake Forest is ever able to clear it. But Tennessee, again, starting to see some opportunities. They're pressuring the back line and having some looks at goal. Here comes Madison Hammond all the way down here. And played in the seam to Bedford. Bedford. And I think Hammond didn't realize how much space she had. She starts running and is waiting for somebody to challenge her. Probably maybe even played that too soon into Bedford, I would say. She could have taken it a little bit longer, maybe had Bedford spin out. Again, that goes with the chemistry, just a, in communication out there. But check this shot out. Had some spin on it, no knuckling there, but she put her shoelaces on that one for sure. And a shot and a miss. Laurier able to get a nice left strike there, but just wide of the goal. The Wake Forest men's soccer team has, has moved to the hill. Walt Chiswick's <laughs> Alumni Hill to uh, cheer on the Wake Forest Stephen Deacons and potentially harass the Tennessee right. goalkeeper. 
this uh, girls team will be back on the field on Sunday against Charleston. That's a one o'clock kick in Tennessee and will, that will not be broadcasted. And then Tennessee heads home to Xavier. 26 will be glad to get back to the old Rocky Top. And a throw in. And again, I'd like to give a shout out to our crew tonight. Such a great job in the first broadcast of the year. Anthony Greer, Kelsey Crook on replay. The graphics is Lindsey Hofferbert, as always, doing a fantastic job. Alex. Burdine, Justin Cox on camera, Carl Russell on camera, Paul Weed on camera, Topher Abbott on camera, Gerald Vaughn, Travis Pfeiffer, and of course, Everett, our, our producer, always doing a standout job here for the ECC Network Extra, and James Overstreet, the executive producer. Putting us, putting us in the booth here and being able to broadcast the beautiful game of footy. There's the freshman, Marco. And again, Bailey Feist with plenty of space. This is a, not sure if they're trying to find Bedford over there, but Laurier put one in the air. Tennessee's a little stretched out now. We're not seeing them as compact. Wakes have a little more room to run. step play by Perea. Great camera work as well. It's Perea, she's gonna try to curl it. I saw where she was trying to go. It was blocked by the Tennessee defense. Ryan Brown looking for Laurier. She plays it smart to Bedford. And Vicki Krug moving all the way up here. We saw a lot of that last year. And the Deeks keeping it here on the final third. They move it around. Their back line is up with Madison Hammond and Vicki Crew. Bedford able to put a boot on it, but couldn't corral. And Katie Cousins immediately plays it to the left channel. And here's that transition, but Tennessee's just not really able to get the numbers up. Very much an individual effort by number five there for Aaron Tennessee, Gilroy. Aaron Gilroy. That's a good reason why she was absent, right? Because she was <laughs> a World Cup in France. Yeah, she playing for the U.S. The U20s were were not able to advance in the World Cup. Uh, very disappointing for the U.S. It's interesting, you know, people you know, chastising the U.S. for everything that's going wrong, while at the same time that the U20s didn't get out of group play. The U15 national team went down and ended up winning. They were the youngest team down in, I believe it was Florida for the U15 uh, CONCACAF um, championship. Uh, so interesting how, you know, depending on how you look at it, you, your 20s didn't do well, your 15s did fantastic, a young team. Um, so U.S. soccer still reeling a little from the men not qualifying. And I thought you weren't going to bring that up this broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Mass and Hamlin. Play for Shet. There's Ryan Brown. Lost it and brought it right back. As Tennessee again had another opportunity. They have five shots and Lake Forest with 10, excuse me, nine is number 10 actually, Laurier. They're getting, getting into a little scuffle with the Maya Neal. So, of course, the referee is going to have a chat with him. Let's see. What, check this chance out. The lofting ball and a nice header. And I believe that was Anna Bielzak. And here's the foul. As Laurier, yes, went through the player. And, yeah, I wasn't happy with that, rightfully so. Well, Neil gets up and... His little shoving match. And Aller called for a free kick for the Vols. 
right outside of the 18. This is a dangerous spot, again, if you're Wake Forest. Holding on to a 1-0 lead. And there'll be a free kick awarded to the Volunteers. Interesting to see what Tennessee does here. They're gonna put two in, three in the Wake Forest wall. Will they try something cheeky where someone will peel off or will Cousins look to strike it on her own? I've just been amazed with Coach Penske's set pieces and how he moves his players around. And Wake Forest right in the wall there. And there's Cousins with a shot and a goal. She found the window and she took advantage of it. And she finds the equalizer. If Shet not happy, she immediately throws it up to the center circle. Well, as a, as a goalkeeper, that ball was placed right in the middle of the D. And so she, she set it up. Usually you would put that a little more, and I've, I've got to see the replay again if it was set up off to the side a little bit, but a lot of times you'll put that wall kind of where you're more comfortable diving, and, and that was actually set up a little off center. But just great placement there by Cousins, and Frechette did lay out for that, and you see just bent it, actually had the screen from the wall and then the runner peeling off of the wall, making it difficult for Frechette to see it, but well-placed ball, and, and that is why Katie Cousins is <laughs> on the Mac Herman Trophy watch list. Well-designed play, too. Like you said, with that pick, and Laurier immediately put her hands in the air, and she had kind of messed up on that particular set piece, but it's tied 1-1. So ball game on, right, Terry? Let's see what Wake Forest can do to counter this. As we now sit at 30 minutes left to go in regulation. That's a beautiful way of opening that window and you got a player like Katie Cousins and she's going to execute. Which by the way, she did have offers by Wake Forest as well. And there's Laurie here trying to go inside. And that's the sixth shot for Tennessee thus far. Still down in the shots category with Wake Forest with nine and Tennessee with six. Tennessee trying to play a little possession ball. Nice give and go there on the left side. Calling for it again. And Ravenna just going to play it out. Penske now got his MO back because they're tied 1 1. Tennessee again threatening and a fingertip punch out. By Frechette. Great or little tip over with you. <laughs> great little opportunity there by Riley O'Keefe, but just a, a fantastic Tennessee. save by Noni Frechette. It just sort of popped up. One of those things that doesn't look too dangerous, but all of a sudden you're kind of caught, and it's yeah. just a tiny little flick over, and Frechette able to get her paw up there and just pop it over to give Cousins an opportunity at a corner kick here. And they're bunched up right there at the penalty line. Cousins. Putting an out swinger, and Frechette comes up to meet it. That was Riley O'Keefe there. And Frechette's done a good job of controlling the box. Really has made a couple of good saves when she's needed to, but has been consistent back there for the Deeks. Still up on the shots category, despite the Vols attacking so much here in the last five minutes. But the corner kicks, four for Tennessee, not one for Wake Forest. There's Vicky Crew. Trying to throw it in here. The ball 
Ross just trying to put it deep in the attacking third. Here comes the Vols again with possession. He's on the outside flank on the left. Nola. Not exactly the touch she wanted on that one. She needed a little bit more power, but Fischette able to smother it. And she'll roll it out to the freshman, excuse me, the sophomore. That was the freshman, apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Voss out of Poland. Twelve states and five countries represented for Wake Forest, with Ohio being the most represented with five, California with three, and Colorado with three. And they go to the right flank, and that's Ryan Brown. Normally Ryan Brown in a foot race would have an advantage, but going against Maya Neal there, a little more difficult. Yeah. Good idea there for the volunteers. Just unlucky it'll be a throw in for Wake Forest. And Emma Magnolia able to beat Madison Hammond there, but wasn't really able to get an angle on that ball in. She put it right at her right foot and just could not get the contact she wanted. As Bedford challenging Maya Neal. I think one of the things we're seeing is both teams are kind of getting a, a little more spread out, right? We saw both teams were a little more compact at the beginning of the, the game in the first half, and seeing a little more stretching openness in the midfield. And you see Gilroy only backing close to the touchline here on the right side. And Bielzak getting a lot of touches tonight. She's had some good looks at goal. Peyton Perea. Knocking the ball around. Tennessee has closed down the pathways. Especially on this left side. Let me try the right side with Bedford. Aurier. Bailey Feist had her hand open, or up, and there's Ryan Brown with it open. Is DeMarco trying to get it to her? And you see Tennessee has those numbers back. When you're playing a team like Wake Forest that can possess so well, it's important to really clog down those passing lanes and make it difficult for them to find spaces. Trying to do a little give and go there between Bedford and DeMarco. And Bedford got caught up. Tennessee backs away from the press a little bit as Wake Forest will knock it around the back. Hammond. Here's a foot race between Bedford and Maya Neal. mentioned that Neil was coming off the injury. She has not played a full 90 minutes, getting 50, 60 minutes. Coach Pensky trying to see how she feels. She's definitely, they're, they're going at her and we're seeing her having to, to make those runs, how she fares over the next 25 minutes. Kind of a testament to how she's, well, she's recovered. I'm trying to get a call. I believe they played advantage there, Sari, as Laurier. Trying to go 1v1, lost it, but Vicky Krug was able to bail her out. Peyton can hit it from there, and she tried to give it a look. Perea. Wild space for Madison Hammond, but closing in quickly is Tennessee. And the attack dies down. And we're seeing 
Wake with that ton of possession. So can, when Tennessee gets the ball, can they be smart with it, right? What are they doing to keep possession? We see a foul there by Krug. But not only are they able to get it, are they able to find those opportunities where they can get quick in transition or maybe change the point of attack. There's Ren French, the sophomore, trying to go. And Krug just got in the way, I guess they called obstruction. Is that fair to say, yes, sir? Or yeah, sort of set a wall there by herself. <laughs> right. Pick and roll like Stockton and Malone. A beautiful served ball, and Frisette has to come up with it. Couldn't quite make the catch. And I would say that was actually interesting. I don't know if she was trying to, to really hit that on goal, or it almost looked like she got too much of it. And it was just hanging there, and Frisette sort of mistimed it. But... So it was a shot that turned into a pass. A yeah. Well, sometimes you want to try and play that ball kind of just outside right. of the range of the goalkeeper, so they have to make that decision. Do I come out or do I hold my ground and I let somebody maybe head it into me? And a lot of times, um, keepers can get caught in that sort of no man's land. And so, you know, do you think you're quick enough and fast enough to get it? Or I'm not sure if I am, so I'm just going to sit here knowing that it's going to be a header and I'll be in a good position to make that, that save. And she committed to it. She just couldn't quite get her paws around it. But yeah, I think it hung a little bit longer, and so she kind of lost it as she was coming down. Interesting uh, choice of placement for Tennessee. Try to go with a long ball. By the midfield is the captain, Perea, and she's looking for an option. She'll play, play Laurier. Bedford, nice turn. Ryan Brown trying to settle it and play either Bedford or DeMarco. Well, and Laurier, she can play with both feet, but we've noticed her, she really likes to go inside a ton. And so that's something, you know, we're going to see her get the ball. Can she find Bedford? The Prochette coming off. Way off her line and outside of the 18. A gutsy play. But smart, right? Exactly. She knew she was out of the box. She put herself in a good position the way she was coming out and, and sliding at it. And, you know, Krug unable to get back. And so she does it, stays big, but goes full on for the slide tackle. Definitely a gutsy play for Bouchette, but. A clutch play, too, because able to come up and clear it. And here's the young Franks getting back in the lineup for the Deeks. We said she was a spark in that first half. Tiny little thing, but very energetic. Was able to get in line a couple of times. We talked about her pace. She, she's also a track star in high school. Again, trying to keep some Fast players on the pitch for Coach Tony to lose, and Bedford still fights with it, gets it right back, and plays it to Frank. Frank, gonna have to go 1v1 and use her speed, and knocked out of bounds by Tennessee. Under 20 minutes to go in regulation, it's 1 1. Wake Forest broke the ice with a goal by Bailey Feist. And then a free kick by Katie Cousins. The window opened and she took advantage of it. And ties it up at one apiece. Crew now makes her way all the way down here. Trying to play Laurier is Peyton Perea. Couldn't quite get over the head of the Tennessee defense. And Tennessee is playing very direct right now. They're trying to get the ball. Can they get a player running on? Wake Forest has done a good job of, of denying those opportunities. For sure, it's done a fantastic job again, making her presence known. Might not <laughs> make the back line a little comfortable, but <laughs> at least she's coming out and being assertive. got four saves on the night. Shea Yanez only has two. And the D 
Deeks still up on the shots category with 10 to eight. Voss with that left foot, she can just ping it around. It's a little heavy on the touch here, but so far after the first game against Northwestern, because the Indiana game was canceled, I can see a little bit of the chemistry finally coming around for Wake Forest. Well, and you know, Wake Forest, they had a ton of girls in the second session of summer school, really trying to build that chemistry, get the girls in the weight room. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's so important for a team is, is, is really the culture and, and who they are and, and, and what they want. Um, you know, preseasons have changed a ton, but if teams can get those kids in in the summer and, and really start early, it, it, it just helps give them that little bit of advantage. And we see a lot of the bigger universities are able to, to get kids coming in in the summer. And Wake Forest is such a prestigious university. Um, I can remember back in the day, it was, you know, I think one of the top 10 universities with regards to like workload. And so kids coming in, being able to take some of those classes helps them out because we have to remember given some of the crazy travel schedules we see in college athletics, these kids are student athletes. Um, and I think that's something that, that separates the ACC sometimes from these other big conferences is the fact that you have schools like Duke, Wake Forest, UVA, Notre Dame, Chapel Hill. Um, <laughs> you know, and so it is, it's, it's not just preparing your kids for the, the rigors of athletics, but how do they handle the rigors of athletics given the academic requirements that these universities have? And, you know, I used to talk Robbie Church a lot about this, how they would always lull towards that end of the season as we're watching the play build up here for Tennessee, um, but because of exams. Another and it was, corner for Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, and it was always tough because he had to figure out how to pace his team <laughs> as the season was getting difficult, but school was getting difficult. And, you know, now we see Duke you know, continuing to be in the top ten, final fours. He's figured it out. Right, right. <laughs> um, but that's things that we have to consider. As Kelsons is going to take the, the corner. And she's really looking for as that Tennessee player peels off to the backside. She's trying to see if she can kind of almost over hit it and get that player on the far post. Hasn't been able to find it. And they're going to call a free kick again for Tennessee. There's a shots category with again Wake Forest still holding on to that 10 8 advantage. And there's the foul. That's, that's a little unbalanced there as Wake Forest has 11. And Tennessee with only five. A free kick again with Cousins behind the ball. It's a dangerous spot if you're Wake Forest. You have to love how teams always put two peelers on the ball, three players on the ball. Oh, let's try and be cheeky. What are we going to do? And you know, here Tennessee now has somebody else coming to it, but pretty much Cousins like, yeah, I got this. And we all know 22 is going to take it, right? But let's see how they work this free kick again, that wall. And there's that cheekiness. I think that was Vignolia that peeled off and they slotted it to her and Frigette came out and it looks like she's holding her ankle. Yeah, she went down. But Wake's got to get it out. And actually, Frank saved it. So will Tennessee play that ball out or they're going to continue to play an attack? And what she's got to do is almost step out of the play here. Great executed play. I mean, they didn't get the goal, but you're lined up and expecting a blast from Cousins and then just play it. And that's what her. I talked about. You have your different set pieces and you put people in the wall and is it something, are they a distraction and you're just gonna bend it in or are they gonna pop off and you're gonna be cheeky? So the things that you would drive you nuts, uh, you know, as a former player playing when you have free kicks like that, it's just everybody jump in the box and run around rather than <laughs> let's take advantage. You're right here in front of the goal. Let's do something creative to, to create something. 
Well, when, like when, you're coach, when you're coaching U8 soccer, you really don't need to spend time on your free kicks and your your, your PKs, <laughs> which, which coaches love. But when you're playing at this level, these are the differences between advancing in a tournament and not. And um, it's always interesting to see the creativity of the coaches and how it plays out. Thanks lined up here on the 18. There's a free kick awarded, and here's Peyton Rivera, excuse me, Peyton Perea. And that'll be the first corner for Wake Forest. It's as if Adam Bedford said, please give us a corner. <laughs> and I think that, you know, that was the right idea because with that shutting down, she said, let's just play it off Tennessee, get a corner here. Well, let's see how they play it. Here is Olivia Voss. And Ryan Brown's coming back into the game for Laurier. They're going to put Bedford, they're going to start her close to the line and see where she makes her run, but we are going to expect this to be a well-driven, in-swinging, left-footed ball. And Shea Yan is able to get a hand on it over the head of Hannah Bedford. Feist to Deke still down here. Oh, beautiful footwork. Feist! And oh, look at that back of grab. But yeah, that's, that's more important. Shea Yan is was able to make that grab. I mean, unbelievable Feist. footwork here by Feist. She's able to play it in bending, and you see her get a little bit of air, a little bit of air, and able to hang on to it. Nice and clean. And that will work, because Peyton Perea made the right run, just about an inch shy of putting the head on it. But I don't know if she wanted to put a head on it, because that was a blistering ball by Bailey Feist. We're almost 10 and a half left to go in regulation. 1-1 one, one our score. DeMarco playing Frank. Well played by the freshman. Bedford, well she gave it a rock. She does. And it's right into the hands of Yanez. And Wake Forest is really looking to try and play everything into Bedford and can Bedford either turn and shoot or can she find some sort of connection with a midfielder we haven't seen Feist getting into the middle of the field so much, um, but still getting forward a bunch. Marco tried to play it. I believe that's Cousins. No, it's not. It's Maya, Maya Neal. That's right. Maya Neal went down, and she's clutching her left calf, it calf. looks like. Yes. Well, we talked a little bit about the fact that she had not played 90 minutes. She's coming off an injury. I think she played the 50-something um, in one game, 60-something in the other day. And now she's looking at, you know, 81 minutes, not to mention the fact that they got in later in the evening last night. I think they came in, and Tennessee went straight to dinner, have dinner at 7 o'clock, and then, you know, they're getting ready for bed. And a lot of times when teams are traveling, they'll try and get in a little bit earlier and get settled. Um, but Tennessee is one of those awkward distances. You're not going to fly from Tennessee. I mean, so they, they, they took the bus in, and we see here, you know what? It looks like she actually struck the ball with her other foot and just stretched it out. And I think, I think that might just be a, a bit a of a cramp there. As you see, they kind of get a little massage thing going. But Maya Neal, it's hard to believe, only just a junior, a redshirt junior, again with that kind of skill and that pace. Uh, part of that United Coaches All Region second team last year. All SEC first team. So, I mean, just how much talent can Pinsky have on this field and then on the bench? Well, they've really built a program. Like we said, they had a bit of a, a, of a hiatus in the NCAA tournament. Last time they were in the NCAA tournament prior to last year was 2012. He mentioned the fact that the senior group, they've sort of seen the lean times, but we see they're going to go Xavier, Wright State, they're at ETSU, Tennessee Tech, you know. Once again, Xavier's had a ton of turnover in coaching. It's kind of an interesting story there. Um, but, you know, not too difficult to schedule before they get to the SEC. And then Wake going to College of Charleston, Michigan, has a new coach, you know, the assistant coach from USC, won a national championship, Jen Klein, first head, well, I'm sorry, second head coaching job. She was at UNLV, successful there. Penn State, another fantastic program. South Carolina, Longwood actually is a team that, you know, does well in the Big South. I think they have one of the, Wake Forest coming in with one of the, the toughest schedules they've had. 
And they'll face 10 teams that have debuted in the United Soccer Coaches preseason top 25. And two that were in the College Cup. Of course, that was South Carolina and Duke. Uh, but that Penn State, I mean, that's the reason why this Wake Forest has a tough, tough schedule. You see Penn State and South Carolina that, that pop out immediately. Uh, and it was, it, they lost to Penn State in the NCAA tournament, the second round. It's hard to imagine that Wake Forest, who was ranked in the top 25, their first round game was against uh, number 15, Georgetown. Then they head to West Virginia to take on a top-ranked Penn State team. The, and this is first and second round. Yeah. And Tennessee, of course, played Murray State. Then they took on Washington State and lost to PKs. But quite a road for Wake Forest to have to go to Georgetown and then take on Penn State. I, lo I, lo I love Davey Nolan at Georgetown. I mean, he's been there forever, really built that program you know he used to be a club coach and you know getting players getting players he had a great run he had both of the Corbeau sisters um, and he's just been able to maintain that the last few years I mean such a such a great guy another part of the goalkeeper clan um, but yeah tough tough opener for the Deeks last year in the tournament and here we have Tennessee balls popping out a little oh, well played too at six and seven, Penn State at six and South Carolina at seven. Amazing. Georgetown actually clocks in now this year at 23. So again, Georgetown back doing what they usually do. And a heartbreaker here at Spry Stadium and PKs all at the hands of Frechette. But the Teaks, of course, they definitely executed the PKs to advance to the second round. Cousins. Bedford with the pressure. Asking for the double team, and Frank got kneed in the chin, and I believe the bench is calling for it. I don't know if they were calling for help or just to try to make a call, but I think she'll get it. There'll be a free kick awarded to Wake Forest, and of course, captain number 14 is right there to try to put the ball in play. And you see Ryan Brown is the option on the far left. We've got Voss in the attack as well. The height of the center back from Poland coming up. Let's see what happens here. I saw her. Yeah, it was her elbow right to the chin. And here comes the ball played beautifully into the 18 by Perea. Crew. As the flag it goes up, I saw the line's judgment just kind of there ready to Fights just a throw little bit offside yeah. there. The line judge was right there, and he was ready to throw that flag up, and he sure did. It's interesting. That's the second ball that we've seen really high and lofted in as opposed to trying to drive it and pick out a target. Two offside calls for both of these teams. Actually, two total, one per team, which is kind of impressive as well. So coming here with about six and a half left to go in regulation. Well, and a lot of that too is Wake Forest gets those runs from those midfielders, so they're they're starting deep and then able to to make those penetrating runs. I feel a little bit like a broken record. I've said it, but it's something that that they stand out because of the mobility. And and one of the things that Tony Deleuze has done year in and year out, success or not, is he. He plays good soccer. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes it's almost like, all right, Tony, let's not play good soccer. Let's just try and boot it and get the goal. Um, but he, he does, and, and, you know, it's a testament to, to sticking true to that style, and he gets the good players that can play that way. And here's a little ball skips into the box there, and no one able to get on the end of it. We've got six minutes left in the half here. Great shot at Tony. Looks exactly the same, a little more gray in his beard. Yeah. There's, there's a scoring summary so far with Bailey Feist in the 33rd minute. And of course, of course Katie Cousins in that 60th minute is tied up 1-1. And we are getting down to the nitty gritty, of course. It's about five and a half left to go in regulation. Number 13, Tennessee tied here with Wake Forest 1-1.
Tennessee somehow keeps it in play. The flag goes up. This was a full rotation over the line there for a throw in awarded to Wake Forest. I think Tennessee's got to get possession of the ball and kind of change that point of attack quickly and try and you know, find somebody on that weak side. We haven't seen a ton of that. They really played a little more direct. Um, Tim Riley O'Keefe kind of giving pressure to the freshman over there. And skies it out of bounds. They're going to try the right flank, and of course, that's Gilroy. Great defensive play by the sophomore Vicky Krug. Tied to try the tightrope down that goal line. As it's Vicky Krug timed it just right. But unfortunately for Wake Forest, unfortunately for Tennessee, yet it's another corner kick awarded to the Vols. And you see Gilroy just trying to see if she has an option, but Krug able to recover back. Nice clean <laughs> but firm slide tackle to win it. Had a beautiful angle on it. This should be an in-swinger here. Well played. Go out of bounds. Tennessee. And Krug wants it. You see here, Cousins striking that ball with the right side of the right foot, playing that top of the six out swinger to the In ball. Swinger. Out swinger. <laughs> what have you? Three minutes left, Sari. Are you getting excited here? Because it's 1 1. This could potentially be our first overtime of the season, but Frank. Taking on Vignolia, able to keep possession of the ball. Look at the hustle, recovering back like that. You have to love that from the players. We saw Wayne Rooney with just one of the, the highlights of probably, I, I don't know, the last few years, his hustle for DC United, getting back, winning the ball, going the other way, getting the assist, although the keeper probably should have had that <laughs> long ball, but still pretty awesome to see that work rate from a player like Rooney. And he's on his way to the end of his career. You can see that kind of hustle from him is remarkable. He's now he's moved his career to the United States in the MLS. Frank all alone on the right side. So puts one in the box as he's trying to find Ryan Brown, but Ryan he Brown was behind just, the goal. Yeah. <laughs> a little too far, far post there to get on the end of it. And Frank had a ton of time, almost wondering if, you know, do you wait and see if you, know, you can get more numbers in the box. A minute and a half, just about here. Regulation, I think Sarah already said it, we're headed to overtime, but we'll see. I have called everything so yes, far this match. <laughs> you really have. Just, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so do we have some free soccer on the horizon? We'll see. We're taking some time. And going deep. You see the skill on that freshman DeFranco, able to win the ball and then keep possession. Looks like both teams kind of just moving away from trying to do any attack and let the time tick down. Uh, I 
again trying to go down that left flank and then knocked away is the time that out five seconds. Will there be any last second heroics for Tennessee? Nope. And we are headed to overtime. Free soccer series. Wake Forest still with 12 shots over 10 Tennessee. Definitely making for an exciting second half. You know, Cousins just able to step up when Tennessee needed a goal. And we see her just bury it. And then here's that first half goal by Bailey Feist. Get the monkey off the back. We got our first goal. We're excited to play. We see it from a different angle here. Her burying it just wide of Shea Yanish, who had a shutout, two shutouts coming into this match. And so now we are tied 1-1 going into overtime and look at that the ability to just bend that ball cheekiness by tennessee to put somebody in the wall and then pop them out i see laurier putting her hands on her head she, you know, as soon as they made that move to create that kind of disturbance that caused the window to go wide open and they took advantage of it got the equalizer and now we sit here one one headed to overtime but Bailey Feist, you know what's interesting on that goal though was uh, how Hannah Bedford was able to kind of stop the defense a little bit or stifle them a little bit with a look over to the right, therefore causing them to think she's gonna go right. Then she did a no look to the left and there was Bailey Feist and she took the one timer right in the back of the net. Yeah, and that ability, sometimes you don't have to dance on the ball, it's just your ability to make a little feign, hesitate, able to throw off the defense. And, and you see that, Sorry, yes. Shea Yanez, you know, we talked about her, her leadership. She's there kind of organizing her team, talking to them a little before Coach Penske, Kurt, and Morgan talk to them. And this is, you know, one thing you said, like Tennessee got here last night. Here they are playing a very, very competitive game. Obviously, we're going to overtime. And then now we're looking at their extra soccer. Uh, Wake Forest again, they'll play Sunday at 1. And then Tennessee goes back to Rocky Top to take on Xavier. So, yeah, there's one of these things that maybe will bode well for Wake Forest since they've only had one game. I know that was last week with the field conditions, but apparently it didn't bode well for them because they did not play the first game and only played one game in that Hoosier Classic. And it did not, obviously, get the win. As a result, they won it. They lost 2-0. And they come back home for their home opener, taking on a top 20 team 13 in the country Tennessee here 1-1 one, one. so let's see what kind of energy again can they keep the energy move on and try to get the upset here well and I think it's a long season and both of them have such a strong strength of schedule that you know whether it goes in their favor or not tonight there's there's so much time left in the season but to get that win is huge Wake Forest beating a number 13 huge for them Tennessee able to get a victory over Wake Forest, who is going to have a very good strength of schedule, which will help Tennessee if they struggle a little bit this season. So, you know, will it hurt them if they lose? No. Can it help them tremendously to win? Definitely. And, we're, you know, we're looking at the stats here, you know, shots evening out a little bit. Wake Forest 12, Tennessee 10. We see corner kicks now. Tennessee has the advantage. Um, but it's been an interesting match in the fouls. ACC game 10 to 12. You got to like it. Both players are getting after Both sides are getting after it. They really are. And it's, you know, once Tennessee able to, to get that equalizer, you can see the type of confidence that they have gotten. Here's the overtime rules here as we head into overtime right now. Two 10-minute periods, a sudden victory. So once you score, it's over. Uh, there is no re-entry in the first or the second overtime periods. It's still tied in the second overtime. The game ends in a tie. You will not see PKs, um, unfortunately, for Frechette, since she's done such a good job. That's a... Uh, Tony, Tony Deleuze's wife and dog on the hill there supporting the team a well, little rivalry here we got going on those <laughs> husky versus german shepherd as uh, i guess the excitement of this scc acc battle is moved over to the dog world <laughs> brother just playing 
Tony Deleuze, you know, we talked about him as, a, as such a fantastic coach. His son, Austin Deleuze, um, you know, playing for the Carolina Rail Hawks. He's had a, a very good career, you know, was on the national championship team here, has, has been a, a, a fantastic contributor to the Rail Hawks. His wife is, a, is an artist, uh, also theater, writes plays, you know, creative, great family, you know, very supportive in the community. We had a... There's a big soccer camp in Greensboro every year for underserved youth, about 400 kids. And the girls that were at summer school for Wake Forest women's soccer came out and volunteered. Some of the guys that were at summer school from Wake Forest and even High Point you know, came out and volunteered. And then you know, Tony and his wife showed up to kind of check it out. And so you know, you got to love that the family, they've been here for over 20 years. You know, they're just invested in the community, invested in the university, and invested in the kids that come through the programs and it's really you know when you come to wake forest you're you're, you're coming to this new family and I, I think that's something that's so special and you know of course same thing at, at tennessee um as well what what brian and john and joe have tried to do, do there tennessee immediately on the attack trying to get this thing over with madison hammond tripped up excuse me that's peyton no that's madison Hammond. excuse me and she's upset she calls they get the yellow card, the first yellow card of the match. And it's to Marcano, Danielle Marcano, the senior. I'll see we have here kind of. And that's match Voss over. kind of all over her. You see the frustration there at the end by Marcano, takes it out on, on Hammond. Should maybe have there have been a call beforehand? You yeah. know? And the and you could see Madison Hammond waiting for some kind of contact right there. She knew as soon as that was going to be contact, she was going to be starting barking at the referee, and that immediately what she did. And got the yellow card, so apparently it worked. But Wake Forest in Tennessee, tied here 1-1. One, one. We played just about a minute first overtime action. And trying to go long, and they get past the freshman. And luckily, Prochette, who's been outstanding tonight, comes off her line and clears it. Yeah, she's really done a, a good job of controlling that space behind the box. DeMarco. Freshman has played the entire game. Very, very talented freshman, DeMarco. Pennsylvania, part of that Penn Charter School. She was the number five prospect in all of the New Jersey. If you're familiar with that, right, Sherry? Best players come out of New Jersey. <laughs> Into the left flank. This is Gilroy. Two Wake Forest Demon Deacons marked up on that particular play there and swallowed up to no avail for the Vols. That's for shit. We'll just roll it out and play it short and simple. Laurier back in the game there on the left side. Oh, just tried to bring it across her body, but ball's been moving pretty fast tonight. Had some rain the night before. So somewhat fast pitch. The facility upgrades that Wake Forest has done in the past two years have just been unbelievable. They redid the practice fields, they redid the stadium turf, new scoreboard. You know, you're you're looking at universities and now, you know, the emphasis on not just having a good football team, but having, you know, these incredible women's soccer teams, men's soccer teams, you know, what Bobby Muse has done on the men's side here, you know, not just picking up where, where Jay Vitovich left, but I think exceeding in some ways, you know, when he came in, they weren't sure what was going to happen in the last three years have just been unbelievable for the, the Deacon squad. They've got the facilities that definitely put a nice product on the field as Tennessee comes back with possession and move it again over to the left using Gilroy. And they've tried that a lot. And here's Makano, a bit of speed, able to keep it in. This is very dangerous. This could be a shot. 
and she kind of had to do a fadeaway shot there. She lost her balance inside the penalty box. Didn't really have much support. I think the, the AR was a little bit late getting to that line, but Marcano able to keep it in and, and beat Vicky Krug, which I think is probably one of the tougher defenders that you can face. She had it very well played all the way up to the time she tried to put a shot on. She just kind of lost control, faded off. And we're still locked here, 1-1 in the first overtime period. And you're seeing Tennessee they're getting more numbers up in the first half. There were a couple of times where you weren't seeing the balls getting in the box and now we've seen them getting forward, but can they track back now, recover? And here's Feist. Maya Neal trying to force her to go backwards. Bedford just couldn't get a good foot on it. I don't know if it was deflected or not. But I was looking at that counter at Sherry, and it didn't look like they had much urgency to try to get up the field there. Especially when you're you know, trying to get the win here. There's five minutes left to go in the first period of overtime, but just try to get their personnel up the field. Quick transition, are they? Right. Are they able to get numbers into the attack? Bedford had a good look. She just seemed to scuff it. And I couldn't tell. I, I would almost say she, like, doinked it. I don't know if, if, if it was... Miss hit, but deflected, but a little bit of a doink there. Gilroy again, trying that left side. Slide tackle by Krug. It'll be a corner kick mm -hmm. awarded to the Vols. And Krug is a tough player. She's not afraid to slide tackle, but I would say us seeing her slide tackle this much is a little bit of a sign of fatigue and the fact that we are, you know, four and a half minutes left in overtime. Usually she's a little bit quicker, able to recover. But Marcano has some pace, so... A little bit of trouble here on the right side for the Deeks. Yeah, the volunteer have someone there trying to pick the goalie. And somehow, some way, Frechette was able to come up with it. I didn't even see her, and she <laughs> came up with a ball in her hands. You rarely want your goalkeeper to turn their back on the goal, but the way those players were positioned, she kind of grabbed it and spun out. Here's Krug again trying to go into the middle. Bumped off the ball, no call of penalty and it'll be a free kick for the Demon Deacons. The volunteers quickly get back. About three and a half to go. First period of overtime. Again, if this game remains tied after two periods, there will be no PKs. It will just go down as a tie. So some say that's exciting. Some say it's just a hard way to say, to find out a winner. But in this case, we will not see PKs if it remains tied. Again, you see Gilroy again, like right on the touchline. They use this left side. It's Feist poking it to Frank. Here come the Deeks on the attack. Marco trying to make a run. And a hustle to get there. Luckily, Bedford's there. Bedford with a step over. Laurier with her back out. She's able to turn. She wouldn't have put a shot in. She couldn't quite get her foot on it. DeMarco inside the 18. And that will be the second corner for Wake Forest on the evening. The second corner comes in the first <laughs> period of overtime for Wake Forest. And there you see Voss coming in to take it. Poland international player. Who will be taking it with her left foot it's for gonna, a it, it, in-swinger. It, it is, it is going to be a, it's going to be a unbelievable kick to watch. What a take. Oh, just about snuck into that back stick. Did you see that? I did. Beautiful in-swinger. Trying to find Frank again. Got to be impressed with Katie Cousins' play. She is not, oh, she got hit in the head there. But Katie Cousins has been everywhere. It's coming back, playing all sorts of spots where they need her. You got to love Gilroy takes that ball to the chest and pops up with a little thumbs up. Hey, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. 
she's, she's all right. And, and here's a kid who was in France and came back a week ago and then has to get into the swing of, of school, soccer, get back with the team. And so, you know, once again, those overtime on the road games are difficult, especially you're missing Bunny Shaw, you're, you're having to play Gilroy, you're having to play Maya Neal a whole game. I'm sorry, having to play Gilroy, wanting to play Gilroy, but knowing that she's just come off of a, a European travel and, and trip, and so. I move it up to the left side with Crew. Get the Deeks. Find another goal to upset the Wolves. Push it wide and a tough ball to play if you're Frank. Especially, you know, you're not exactly tall there, so that's going to be tough to pull out that leg to try to stop it. Well, but we've seen the, the success of Wake when they've been able to, you know, change the point of attack, get to the weak side. Subbing in is, is the senior Megan Flynn for Tennessee. Let's see how she acts around Vicky Krug because both of them got tangled up quite a few times tonight. Vicky Krug down the le on the left side and she's... I admit, Hammond and her switched about halfway into that second half. She had to move that line around a little bit between the two outside backs. And the countdown now to the end of the first session of overtime we'll go down without a score and we'll head to the second session of overtime will we find a winner or will it just remain tied that's the question what do you think Sherry? i mean if you you seem to be calling everything tonight what's it going to be I, you know, I have to say, I, I think it's something where, where I think we'll see another goal. I, I think if, if Wake Forest can dig deep, you know, one of the things Wake does is they're constantly, you know, rotating those players up top, so they should have legs. Um, but, you know, Tennessee is kind of dangerous when they've been, you know, they, they've been trying to get that ball in between the lines, and, and we haven't seen it, but it's been dangerous. And, you know, here we see again Tennessee, I would say, no, not the toughest of competition. ETSU's had some good years, but going into South Carolina, who's you know top 25 team, um, so so we see a very different schedule from Wake Forest, where their next you know four games are, are not as <laughs> difficult as the Deeks. And then here's a great shot of the NC Fusion. It's NC Fusion night uh, surrounding Wake Forest. Or, NC Fusion Triad, Twins, Greensboro United, a number of clubs. You've got PTFC and High Point, and so the support the team. But we see their schedule, College of Charleston, Michigan, Penn State, That's amazing. South Carolina. And then, like I said, Longwood, you know, mid-major, big south. But they're a team that's done well that, you know, on an off chance, you know, that can even prove difficult after having to play South Carolina a couple of days before. And that's exhausting just thinking about going well, College of Charleston, Michigan, Penn State, South Carolina. And then you get Longwood, and then I think I'm exhausted already just going through this. And that's, that is the reason why they have one of the toughest schedules in the nation, for sure. That amazing to start the season off like that. And here they are locked with number 13, Tennessee, at one apiece. Let's see if they can try to get the upset. They did a year ago against South Carolina. And the first time... The Wake Forest will try to get a victory over Tennessee because the series is all Tennessee Orange. 4-0 here in the fifth meeting. It's a shot of the, some of the soccer team of Wake Forest that will be in action tomorrow night. There's Ryan Brown, the sophomore. Talked about Wake Forest having eight kids with national team experience. You know, just being able to recruit that caliber of player. You know, nowadays, your youth national teams are getting a, a ton of opportunities to play overseas, to play different competitions. So kids are getting to college, and they've they've almost had to deal with the travel. They've had to deal with missing school a little bit. They've had to, to deal with that higher level. And so the top teams, you're going to see squads that have a number of kids that national team experience whether it's here canada or abroad it's tennessee again with the attack wide open again 
as Gilroy hiding out on the flanks as she has done so many times. And she again snuck behind the back line and about found the golden goal. Hammond with a little, maybe a little extra push there, I don't know. But another quarter kick awarded to Tennessee. Eight to two. Tennessee leads in the corner kick category. Nice curling run again. Still inside the 18. And I think we've we've seen Cousins where she's she's tried to over hit it a couple of times. That one a little under hit, but didn't have anybody at the near post, so Wake easily clears that out. Group quickly coming up trying to throw the ball in. She comes all the way to the midline. And the back line has done pretty good job for Coach Tony to lose despite that free kick taken by Katie Cousins. What do you say, Sarah? Oh, definitely. You know, I think Ravenna's stepped up and she's she's been a leader back there. Hammond's done a very good job recovering. You know, we've seen Krug a couple of times having a slide tackle, but very consistent. And then the freshman Olivia Voss having to step in as a center back. I mean, anytime you're, you're putting a freshman in the center back position, you've got to have faith in them. Um, and so she's done well, you know, left footed kid. Um, I think, it, I think it's been a good showing, you know, and, and I think Frigette's done well of, of coming off of her line and, and like I said earlier, kind of cleaning up that space behind the backs. This is maybe a very good opportunity and again, not quite keep her balance, but a well-struck ball though. Yeah, Makano, you know, we, we talked about the fact that, oh, we, you know, Tennessee doesn't have Bunny Shaw, but Marcano's the one who's come in, you know, I talked to Penske and he was saying the fact that, you know, last year when, when Shaw had that, that head injury, you know, Marcano came in, she scored two goals and, you know, hey, uh, three goals, sorry, you know, yes, we were missing her, but we just got three goals from this kid. So, um, you know, here she is a little bit off balance, kind of hooks it and Frigette, you know, in position, able to hold that ball cleanly. Deeks have kind of just been pinned back here as Tennessee really fighting hard to get the golden goal and get out of Winston-Salem with a win. And make it 5-0 and oh against the Deacons. But six and a half left to go. And if nothing changes, we'll go down as a tie. Yeah, you, you know, you'd think that Wake Forest would have played Tennessee more. You know, for years, Ange Kelly was the coach at Tennessee. She played at Carolina. She always tried to play Carolina. You know, would that make her come in and play Wake? Of course, Carolina, usually early on, you know, they play in Duke's tournament, and then Duke plays in their tournament. Um, but you would have thought that, that Wake would have met Tennessee more than this over the 20-plus the years of the program. Yeah, it's interesting to see that it's only been the fifth meeting and sitting geographically right beside each other. Ryan Brown fighting for it, trying to break through Cousins, and she is upset because they give the call to Tennessee. I don't know if she grabbed the jersey or not, but the fans here at Spry, on a beautiful Spry night, they like to say, are not happy with it. So I guess they just want to say that she kind of hooked her yeah, a little she, bit. She pulled her, but I think we saw instances of other people pulling that went uncalled, so. It's interesting, you know, sometimes you have the referees that, are, that are, don't really let the women play enough and think that every kind of tug, pull, whatever is a foul, and then you have, you know, other ones where it's like, uh, <laughs> so just probably kinda, should be called. Right. Now it's now 14 fouls on Wake Forest, 12 on Tennessee. Somewhat chippy at times. Here comes Hannah Bedford. A misplay by Maya Neal. Bedford lining it up, double teamed, and she's upset that no one was there. I don't know if there was a miscue 
Sold well, right there at that half circle. I think Tony was looking to get the call, and now we have a wide open Gilroy here. But I think Tony was trying to get the handball on Neil, but the, the ref let it play on. And Great service by Gilroy. Again, trying to push Vicky Krug out wide. And, and they're going to call a corner kick. And again, you see Madison Hammond very vocal and animated tonight. She's the captain, but she is absolutely livid at that call. I don't know if it did go off on her foot, but the way she played it. Oh, it yeah, looks like when that'd be right. Flynn was coming around, she might have got that touch. So, mm, and another corner. There's Cousin. And up. Well played by Bailey Feist, getting down and dirty inside the 18, getting the trenches and a free kick awarded to Wake Forest. And Wake Forest has done a tremendous job getting on the end of those Tennessee corner kicks, clearing it out. We talked about how Wake Forest might be dangerous on the corner kicks, but they've done a fantastic job defensively as well. Ravenna kind of shielding it off for Frechette. Just puts it wide. And great grab by Frank, able to keep that from going too far out of bounds. Uh, whistle blown again. Looks like it was after the play, possibly. Another dangerous spot with under two and a half to go. Could this be the moment that Tennessee gets their fifth win over Wake Forest with a goal? And we've seen Tennessee be cheeky and have that little ball slotted in off the runners. It looks like she's going to play this in. And it is going to run out. Good defense by Wake Forest. I think we always say when you're inside of the 18, you want to man mark because it's, as long as everybody's marking their man, it's better for the ball to run through. And if anything, the goalkeeper picks it up. If not, if everybody's marked up, then the ball's just going to run out, and that's better. Um, and so we saw good defense there by the Deeks. Well, there's miscommunication there. Was trying to get Rin French to get in a great turnover. Here comes Bedford. Does she have clutch in her? And she just lost it. A little heavy on the touch. Moved it to the left and then poked out by Tennessee's defense. But under a minute and a half, Wake Forest quickly trying to get it upfield to get the golden goal. Correa trying to go way deep to the right and couldn't quite reach Frank. And Voss, you see, very left footed there, <laughs> making that turn, although plays that with her right. Feist. And can they get it forward? Right on a minute left here, and the freshman Frank trying to do work in the corner there, on the side there, excuse me. Well, she's trying to get to the corner for sure, but didn't really have much of an option there to try to play it. It was 1v1, and that was it. And try to move it again to Gilroy. Cut out by Vicky Krug. Somehow, someway got to Frank. I don't know how that got there, but it did. Bailey Fikes trying to meet it. Does she have it in her? Tied up at 1-1. Feist trying to just put it inside the box. Perea with a shot. Did they call a corner? It did, deflected out. There's 13 seconds, seconds. left. And Yanis, Shea Yanis just drops the ball down. Good. Game management there. Five seconds. Four Whether or not seconds. the rest could this stop. be it? A game winner. Perea. Oh, just couldn't get the shoelaces on the ball, and that will end in a tie at one apiece. A well played match between both teams. SEC opponent versus ACC opponent, and it's been quite a dramatic game to say the least. You go 1 1 going into the overtime. We end in the tie 1-1, and Wake Forest will get ready for Charleston, and Old Tennessee will head to Rocky Top. 
And so it's, again, this will be the end. Wake Forest and Tennessee tied up at one. For Sarah Rose, I'm Ty Collins saying so long from Winston-Salem with a final score 1-1. To watch this entire game on replay, as well as other games on our family of ESPN networks, log on to watch ESPN app. This has been a presentation of ESPN. We'll see you next time.